Coming up on today's show, it is a game day. We have a game preview for you as the Bucks get set to take on the Toronto Raptors in a revenge game of sorts. We'll take a look at the defense, whether or not we're actually seeing improvement or if it's just fool's gold and uh, a little bit of a message to all the listeners and Bucks fans out there coming up on Locked on Bucks. You are Locked on Bucks, your daily Milwaukee Bucks podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. And welcome in to Locked on Bucks. I'm Justin Garcia, the Bucks Radio Network. She's Camille Davis of the Technical Foul and, of course, the uh, long time now contributor and now host of this show. We uh, thank you for making Locked on Bucks your first listen every day. We're free and available wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Uh, Camille, I mentioned it is a game day. We will get to uh, some more that we've seen from the Bucks in recent games. You and Frank dove into that quite a bit on the uh, the Monday post-game show. But here we sit with uh, round two against the Toronto Raptors, and it looks a little different than the first time these two teams had played. Number one, this defense possibly taking some subtle strides for the Bucs. Uh, Giannis is listed as probable on the injury reports for today, so I would assume that just comes down to a game-time decision, and we'll hear sometime around 6 o'clock this evening if uh, Giannis is playing. We know there will be no Jay Crowder. And uh, Chris Livingston, who Griff spoke about uh, Monday as well prior to the game, saying he suffered suffered uh, an ankle issue late in that game in Orlando and, and no timetable on how long, but it seemed like maybe a week or so. Marquise Bold and the other player out for the Bucks For the uh, Raptors, you didn't see Christian Coloco in the first matchup between these two teams. He's out once again. Gary Trent Jr. listed as doubtful, who has uh, made a career out of putting up big games <laughs> against the Bucks, and then OG Ananobi when we talk about this defense and flying around the ball the pressure they put on the Bucks in that first matchup he's doubtful as well so you may be catching a break there if you're the Bucks. and after re-watching that first game against Toronto oh God, why? this morning <laughs> I, listen, I knew we were going to talk about it and we were playing them again tonight and I was like you know what let me just go back and, and watch this and my eyes started burning during the first quarter of that game. And at this point, we'll take it, right? Uh, we just saw what the Raptors were able to do against the Wizards in that miraculous comeback win, where they went on a 21 to one run to end the game, even while they were down without OG, without Gary Trent. So even though we won't be seeing those guys tonight, like this is still a Toronto team that we have to take very seriously. And I have to say that first and foremost, we cannot overlook this team because they're missing the notorious Bucks killer uh, and Gary Trent. And they don't have OG. It's still a team that, as we have saw against us and in this most recent game, where they force a lot of turnovers. They play those passing lanes. They're very aggressive. They look to rebound. They look to do a lot of the things that the Bucs have been struggling against. We know they're great in transition. Uh, so it's something that the Bucs are going to have to really be keyed in on, on about. So I hope when they watch that game film as well, um, that they saw the areas they can improve in. And like we mentioned, this is the, the pre-Brook going back to drop phase uh, that the Toronto Raptors saw during our first matchup. So the hope is that with this current uh, team going back to the drop covers that the defense might look a little bit better against Toronto because uh, there were so many different defensive miscommunications during that first game. Just guys lost, not rotating properly. And we still saw that in the Bucks' most recent game earlier this week as well, where there are still times where the communication just isn't working out correctly, especially when they get into those scramble situations on defense where you have to rotate over and cover someone else's guy for the moment because it was either a double team or someone else had covered for someone else, whatever the case may be, they continue have to they have to continue to tighten that up. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how they look against the Raptors with a little bit more playing time together under their belt, as well as putting Brooke primarily back into that drop coverage. Yeah, so the the first matchup between these two teams, you um, somehow were able to to live through rewatching that <laughs> one, but uh, not a whole lot that you could point to and say, eh, well, maybe if this just went this this wasn't one of those games that you say, hey, if 
if we do this or this or this, the, the result may be different. It started slow, which has been a constant theme uh, for this Bucks team throughout this season, and it just compounded from there. You gave up 130 points to a Raptors offense that has remained relatively unchanged for the last handful of years, and I, I don't know that anybody would say the Raptors are in the top tier of offensive teams, and especially when you take a Fred Van Vliet uh, off the floor for them, but the 130 points the Bucks surrendered in that game yeah. are the most they've given up all season long. And look, it's it's not as simple as just looking at the points that you give up. I think we've all kind of progressed to that point where you understand some of the, the nuances to look at versus just the per game numbers and, and how many points did you give up. But there wasn't a whole lot to glean from there of what the Bucks did well. It was very early in the season. It was still um, while you were figuring things out as this team is is continuing to figure things out. It came right before that game against the Knicks where we saw the defense drastically uh, shift backwards. And I do think we've, or, or shift forward, I should say, I do think we've seen some better things from this defense that I do want to get to uh, in a second. But I guess I've kind of been harping on it for the last week or, or 10 days. It seems like this is a Raptors team that I know they they blew you off the floor of the first matchup. Mm -hmm. But on paper, there's a lot of areas you look at and say, okay, there's an opportunity for a get-right type of performance for the Bucs. When we know they're athletic, they're going to cause some turnovers. Obviously, a lot of question marks with who's going to be out there with the injury report. Scotty Barnes is going to be out there. He was a problem uh, in that first matchup between these two teams. But – when you look at how they create their shots, Pascal Siakam knocked down five threes in that first matchup. That's somewhat of a rarity, and it's not a high-volume three-point shooting team. They can get in transition because of their steals that they generate, mm -hmm. but the areas we've kind of singled out for this Bucks team has been slow down the perimeter, and you got to be better in transition. Very, very small growth, but I think we've seen some of it in transition, and this is an opponent that you would look at and say, look, they're not going to theoretically bomb away, so we should be aided there that we can fix that part too. Absolutely, and to your point about the three-point bombing from the Raptors, even in that first game, they only put up 38 three yeah. points. That's Just above team. their season average, yeah. Right, right, and like you mentioned, Pascal Siakam was hot from three, and so was Scotty Barnes. He was four or six from three during that first game, and we're not sure how sustainable that will be, the two of them hitting at you know over a 60% clip from three against us, but like you said, it's going to be a, it's a situation where the Bucks can show that they have continued to make progress, or we can we're going to have another day of questioning why don't things just look quite right with this team and it seems that the Bucks have been progressing in a way that is positive on some fronts right it's not like oh my god no more worries at this point at all like there are definitely still some concerns with this Bucks team but uh it'll be interesting to see how much it sounds like a test or something like that. Like you're in school and it's like, how much have you learned since the last test that you got? So that's why I'm looking at this game for the Bucks in a bit. And I mean, we've mentioned it before, but without Jay Crowder, who was somebody in that first game who didn't put a lot of points on the board for the team, um, but he was effective during his time, as effective as you can be during a blowout loss. But uh, we're going to be able to see more Marjan, more Ajax in this game as well. And if anything, that's something that Bucks fans should be looking at as well, because this is a team, as we know, Griff inherited pretty much the same team that Bud had. And he wants to play ball a little bit differently. I shouldn't say a little. That's underselling it. Ideally, he wants to play basketball differently than the way that Bud does. So with that, you want to see what type of guys fit into the dream Griff you know, system. And on top of that, this is a Bucks team that's salary locked, as we've talked about a lot. So they need to hit on some of their young prospects. We haven't had many hits when it comes to draft picks. And part of that's because we haven't had that many uh, to, you know, try. But you really want to see Marjan continue to grow. You really want to see Andre Jackson continue to grow. So it'll be interesting seeing those two guys out there uh, playing their brand of defense, which is very fast. They move quickly. They don't seem to think too much. They're just reacting. Um, and against that Toronto defense as well, where you're seeing a guy, a, a full team of guys who are reacting that same way. And that's the difference right now. Um, we're looking at the two different defenses. 
there's many, but the one I look at is just Toronto's defense looked so connected against the Bucks during our first game where every guy was on that string. And that is part of why they were able to force so many turnovers, get out and run on fast break opportunities so many times. So if the Bucks can take some of that formula and force Toronto into some ter- into some turnovers as well as into bad positions where we can get out and run, um, we'll love to see that because, as you mentioned, that's a part of the Bucks game where there needs to be more growth. And this is a game where you could definitely see that. Yeah, and two of those names that you mentioned are uh, big pieces for this team going forward in uh, Marjan and Andre Jackson Jr. And I think I've played somewhat of a role in what we've seen from some of these defensive numbers that it it may not be great, but it's at least starting to trend uh, upward for this Bucks mm-hmm. team. So we'll get into that defense and the impact that those two guys have had on both sides of the ball. After we tell you a little bit about eBay Motors, our partners at eBay Motors have teamed up with Locked On Fantasy Basketball host Josh Lloyd to bring you some of the best fantasy picks each week all season long. Whether you're prepping for a daily draft or scouting the waiver wire, every week we're going to provide you players that are guaranteed to fit on your roster. So let's see who Josh has picked out for this week's eBay's Guaranteed Fit Fantasy Players of the week and uh, one that really stands out uh, to me of this group that Josh has meal is Bilal Kulabale, who is uh, a part of the Wizards rotation. A lot of intrigue around Bilal Kulabale following the draft last uh, this past summer. And uh, look, he's still very raw, but you're continuing to see some nice things from him all over the place at times. But he's played 30 plus minutes in the last two games. He's definitely a big piece of their future. Massive defensive option as well, which uh, on a team with Jordan Poole and uh, all the viral moments we've gotten from Jordan Poole thus far uh, is certainly a big piece that you need to have. And look, uh, the 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 defense that we talked about with the Bucs and their struggles they're going through, Bilal Kulabale has two matchups coming up against the Bucs in the next week or so. Uh, Josh Lloyd from Lockdown Fantasy Basketball is going to help you win your fantasy championship. And eBay Motors knows a championship team is about each player being a perfect it same with you and your vehicle. If you have a personal experience about buying a car from uh, eBay, I'm sure a lot of us do. I haven't uh, gone that route quite yet, but I buy just about everything else from eBay. So uh, buying a car is going to be the uh, next step for me in the uh, dream ride, getting that from uh, eBay Motors. And again, eBay Motors and Josh Lloyd helping you dominate in your fantasy league and on the roads as well. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you can make sure your ride stays running smoothly. Brake kits, LED, headlights, uh, roof racks, bumpers, whatever your car needs, eBay Motors has it. And with eBay's guaranteed fit, it's guaranteed to fit your ride the first time, every time, or your money back. Plus these prices that you get from eBay, you're burning rubber and not cash. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. eBay's guaranteed fit, only available to U.S. customers. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. So you mentioned uh, Marjan Beauchamp and uh, Andre Jackson Jr. in what we've seen from them. Just one game, uh, what, five quarters basically since Jay Crowder left with an injury. But we know... It's going to be a lot more than what we had kind of talked about last time you and I were together, assuming well, maybe a week or so with Jay Crowder. Now it's going to be eight of those. So the door is wide open for both of those guys. And, you know, Marjan has had those opportunities throughout the season. We've talked about the growth we've seen from him. And he, you know, offensively, he just looks much more confident than he did a year ago. Not that he lacked in that area, but especially coming out of the draft, the version of Marjan that we were sold, you thought it was basically, you know, Andre Jackson, what we're discussing. Yeah, yeah he's he's got the body. He can defend. And uh, offense is going to be a work in progress. The offense has been much better than I think any of us envisioned this early, and it continues to get better. It's just some of the little things that that he needs to improve on the, on the defensive end, and that'll come with these minutes in the rotation. But, look, I don't want to overreact. Andre Jackson Jr. to me is the guy that has stood out the most of anybody that isn't 
Giannis or Dame Lillard in those games that Damian Lillard won, uh, just because you can see what he provides. And Griff, a couple of days ago, talked about it's almost like a coach to have on the floor, that he kind of knows these things that come intuitively. I've mentioned it a couple of times now in the last few days, but watching that Bulls game, it really struck me a couple of plays that he made where he was the guy that just had the basketball IQ and the instincts. When Giannis went on a contest, a closeout in the corner, and left his spot where we'd seen the Bulls just pounding the Bucks and other opponents too, mm-hmm. uh, pounding the Bucks on the offensive glass. And it was Andre Jackson saying, hey, well, if he's vacating this, somebody's got to take that spot and just slid in there, got the rebound, and started a fast break. That's some of the stuff that the Bucs have really missed the most through these first 10 games of the season, just those little things and the details. And, and that's something he's already brought to the table. Absolutely. And those little things add up from boxing out to running back down the court when the other team gets the rebound or they're on the fast break instead of jogging, just bringing that energy in addition to understanding what your rotation is and what your responsibility is on the floor. And for Andre Jackson to be a rookie coming in and having that understanding and looking like he can already be a solid rotational piece off the bench for this team. And I know there are some people who are already calling like, hey, put him in the starting lineup. And I understand the calls and why that is, because we know, as you mentioned, that the scouting report on Andre Jackson Jr. is that he can do just about anything but shoot. He is intelligent. He knows how to rebound. He knows how to cut off ball. He can play great on ball defense. He can play great off ball defense. He does everything. He can pass well, facilitate. He does everything well except for shooting. And the argument for, of course, putting him in the starting lineup is like, well, you don't have to shoot then. You can be that Tony Snell dude and just play your role, do what you do, be paired with Dame and Giannis and Chris and and do your business. And, you know, maybe one day we get there. I made mention of the fact that it seems to me as if Griff is giving all of the vets, you know, first crack at things, which I think is the way you go about it. And these young guys are just kind of putting in their tape, showing what they can do on the court. And making a case for more playing time. And with Jay Crowder being out, they have a wide open opportunity to continue putting things on tape to show, hey, I need more playing time because what I bring to this team, they need. And Ajax is definitely that guy. I believe it was an 11-0 run at the end of the third quarter against the Bulls that he helped to fuel where it's like they were. he got in the game and they were down two or up two. Game got tied up really quickly and then just out of, knowledge and just the way that he's able to play the game offensive rebounds leading the second chance points for the bucks knowing you know he's left wide open at three-point line not taking that shot shot but stepping in for that floater and getting a bucket in that situation instead and just the energy the way he's able to play at the point of attack on defense is something that this bucks team has sorely lacked so far this season he can even navigate screens fairly well better than marjan i would say at this point um so it's like you mentioned like he does a lot of the things that you want uh, for this team and I understand the offensive concerns with them. But this is a team where at this point, the defense has been a bigger concern uh, than the offense, because it's just like we're used to the Bucks being defense first, defense first, defense first. If you have a good defense, it can lead to other points on the other end of the court, which we know we saw Toronto do it against us in their first in our first matchup where they just used a lot of defense to help create points for them on offense. So Andre Jackson Jr. is definitely a guy who, as I continue to see more of, I'm like, I just want to see more and more and more. And for the everydayers who listen to this show or heard me on Tech File or wherever else, my voice is carried talking about the Milwaukee Bucks. I've been high on Marjan since we drafted him. He seems like a prototypical type of young wing you would want on your team. Um, So for him to have that offensive side of his game developing a little bit more is encouraging as well because of what he can do on defense. Like I mentioned, he's not great with that screen navigation at this point. But one thing I did notice in that Bulls game, it seemed like the Bucs were doing a lot more switching on the perimeter. And I was like, that's one way to uh, try to get over the fact that you don't have many guys that can get through screen. So let's just switch one through four and just try to stick with the the offense in that way. So, yeah, sign me up for more. uh, What what do we call it? Marjax minutes? All of them. (laughs) Want the Marjax. I I basically echo everything that that you said there about uh, Andre Jackson Jr. too in that. I know there is. And look, if he keeps doing some of this stuff. And people may think, well, that's crazy. It's it's what, like 10 games, 10 minutes per game that he's been playing here. And, and that I would assume it's going to start to uptick now 
with no Jay Crowder for uh, at least two months. Um, but I think with those minutes going up, you're you're just going to keep seeing more of that. And I agree with the point about he's to me. I I I don't think this is hyperbole. I think he is already very clearly your best perimeter defender. Mm. And you know, with Marjan, I've I've brought it up a couple of times. You guys have talked about it too. The one thing he's just going to need more reps at doing it. But the one thing you, you'd you like to see is continued growth at navigating those screens and defending the pick and roll. Cause that's, I think the, the glaring part that that stands out right now. It's not the case with Andre Jackson jr. That there was at least five examples in that bulls game where you could see a couple of times, even Javon Carter knew okay, we can't run this anymore because he's already one step ahead and he knows what's coming up here. Um, so I think you're going to continue to see more of that. And I, I think, there's just give it time. There's time to open up the conversation of, well, should his 15 minutes or whatever we sit at go to 20 or 25? And should he get in the starting lineup? You've still got a lot of time to sort that out. The important part is that he's playing now and, uh, and getting some of those, those reps. So to me, that's the big thing that, uh, that I am looking at with uh, Andre Jackson and, uh, and really seeing where he continues to grow here because this matchup against the Toronto Raptors uh, tonight, I know we mentioned some of the offensive profile. We'll get into it a little bit more coming up after the break, but this should be another good opportunity for Andre Jackson and some of the things the Raptors do and, um, and his strength. So uh, certainly one more thing to, uh, to keep in mind for uh, Andre Jackson, this, uh, this upcoming season. Uh, how does free Thanksgiving sound? This year, Ibotta is here to give you cash back and help you make sure your Thanksgiving table is complete because who wants a turkey without the gravy? Turkey's great, but we all know the best part of Thanksgiving dinner is all those sides. And, and with Ibotta, you can make sure you get the whole family's favorite side dishes and the turkey all while you're getting cash back. Starting November 1st, for the fourth year in a row, Ibotta is giving back 100% cash back on your Thanksgiving feast. So just add offers in the app to redeem for everything you need to make your Thanksgiving feast complete. All you have to do is shop at your favorite retailers and upload your receipt. Ibotta gives you cash back on hundreds of grocery items from produce to personal care to pantry goods. So you can make sure you're beating inflation no matter what you're purchasing. Download the Ibotta app now and use code LOCKED to get 100% cash back on your Thanksgiving dinner. It is ongoing. It started November 1st. So again, get the Ibotta app, use the code LOCKED, and you will get 100% cash back on your Thanksgiving dinner. Just go to the App Store or Google Play and download the free Ibotta app. And again, that code is LOCKED, L-O-C-K-E-D. That's Ibotta in the Google Play or App Store and use code LOCKED. Thanksgiving, by the way, just a week away. Can't to, believe it. Uh, I have a lot of cooking yeah. to do, Justin. <laughs> <laughs> Which is absolutely nuts. And hey, while you're doing your cooking, you have something to entertain you in the background. As Locked On has launched their first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube, Locked On Sports Today is here for your 24-7 uh, covering the sports top stories of the day with local exports of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. Go to Locked On Sports Today on YouTube and subscribe for the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel. I mentioned the, uh, the play of Marjan and Andre Jackson. And by the way, I've been very guilty of this as well, but uh, how we say Marjan's name, I just did it again. Marjan, it's I, I think we all kind of blend the two together of Marjan, but it's a capital J for a reason. So I've caught myself doing it a couple of times. Yeah, I definitely wasn't like, uh, yes, I will put more respect on Marjan's name and make sure I take the time to, to put the emphasis on the Jean as well. This uh, Bucks defense, what stands out to me is, look, has it been great competition? No. Uh, but as as we've kind of touched on before, Sometimes that's what you need when you call it a get right game of, well, we should beat this team. We have some advantages. Let's just do it. Even if it's fool's gold, even if it's, we beat up on a bad team. Sometimes you just need that to start the confidence and get the ball rolling as 
as uh, Mike McCarthy used to always say, stack successes. And that's kind of the point the Bucks are at right now. But I think we've started to see it. If you look back, starting with that Knicks game, six games that they had played uh, since, they have the 15th rated defense in the league. And I think coming in, I kind of talked about, I expected the defense to slide somewhere around there. Ideally, you could finish 12th or somewhere close to the top 10. But losing Drew Holiday is huge. So if you can come in at 15 or in the top 15 at least, assuming this offense is going to become dynamic and one of the top at least five offenses in the league, you can get by certainly in the regular season with a top 15 defense where you'll outscore teams. The defense is just doing enough to keep you in the game. And the hope then is, hey, we'll just continue to figure things out and get better going into the playoffs. It's looked like that on the defensive end the last six games. Brooke Lopez has has blocked 20 shots the last six games after two in the first four games of the season. They've gotten better at some of those things, whether it's limiting the opponent uh, offensively in their production, some of the three-point shooting they've been a better job or been doing a better job with. I think Marjan and Andre Jackson Jr. are big pieces to that, Mm -hmm. but again, What stands out and what I would assume is going to continue to be a point of emphasis, we've heard some of this from Griff already, is transition still needs to get better. And there's a couple of things that stand out there to me, rebounding as well. And those two are are, kind of tied together. But also, look, I think we've all mentioned, you know, well, you're going to take a step backward when you lose Drew Holiday. And you don't really put context behind it where it's just, well, Drew's really good. So that's where you're going to miss out. (laughs) Uh, Billy Donovan talked about this before the Bulls game, too, and said, listen, of course they're going to take a step backwards with no Drew. He's an incredible defender, but nobody's mentioning Wesley Matthews either. And I understand, you know, he wasn't a starter and he wasn't playing the same minutes load as Drew. But as Billy Donovan put it, those two guys are junkyard dog killers. And when you have that, it's infectious, and it just sets the tone for your defense. So the loss of those two guys is going to be a big thing for this team to overcome. I think where it stands out most is going into the Bulls game. I haven't checked where it's at now. They were the fourth worst team in the league at defending the pick and rolls and the the points the opponent was creating off of those. And we talked about Marshawn working at that and needing to get better at that. Obviously, teams are going to target Damian Lillard there. We've seen them do the same with Malik Beasley and especially campaign in those minutes that he's in the game. So that part to me is not a surprise. It just kind of speaks to what we said about the overall defense. Just don't finish in the bottom 10. We're not expecting the Bucs to be the best team at defending screens. Just be closer to the midpoint of the league. Could not agree more. If the Bucs can come out of this season with an average defense at, you know, at worst average defense, and like you said, a top five offense, that's still a recipe that you can use to say like, hey, we can win a championship this way. There's many different ways to win a championship. And we saw the Bucks do it with that defense first mentality. We saw how much their offense stalled throughout that entire playoff run to the finals where they were able to win. Um, and now it's kind of like looking like, OK, we've seen this offense stall a few different seasons in a row. Uh, we see how teams play Giannis in the playoffs. We had the injuries to Chris Middleton, which, you know, a lot of people already say like, hey, if Chris didn't get injured, you know, in that year after the title, the Bucs would have beat Boston. And that could be the case, but we don't live in hypotheticals. Like what happened, happened. And now we're reacting to what happened by trying to overcome um, some of the perceived weaknesses of this team, which one of them is half court offense, right? So you bring in a Damian Lillard who you are like, this can be a jolt in the arm to our offense and if you can't get to a top five offense a top offense in this league with this combination of guys then you have to start wondering is that trade-off worth it because we were thinking that this offense would be fueling what this team can do and that the defense can be good enough like even if you don't have the point of attack defenders like Drew Holiday or having a guy like West coming off the bench who can muck things up for the other team you still have Brooke Lopez and then you have Giannis Antetokounmpo behind these guys so you would assume that the very least the defense would be okay average like they can be all right with this combination of guys and right now it hasn't quite looked that way all the way uh, to this point in the season but we're starting to see some signs where hey we might be able to get to that point of average defense at worst like hey we can be 15th or better when it comes to defense in this league and I think that the Bucks would probably look at that and say like we can be top 10 we don't want to be 15th we want to be 
a top defense. Now, I'm not sure if the personnel uh, aligns with that, but we will see. And I think that there are things they can do. We've talked about it ad nauseum at this point now, um, of maybe just switching out some of these guys in the lineup and see how much that can affect your defense. But when it comes to the offense here, uh, we have talked a lot about the fact that Damian Lillard gets off to slow starts. And this particular offseason that he had here with the trade request, not being able to even go to the facility to train as much as he used to, like he was going to come into the season and need some time to get right. And I feel like since the Pacers game, we've seen Giannis be like take that step of like, okay, I'm looking more like myself. I'm coming into form at this point. We still see him get gassed, but that's understandable. It's still early. He had an offseason surgery as well. He's getting his legs back. When Chris is in the game and limited minutes, Chris has done what you expect Chris Middleton to do. Defensively, there are still times where I'm like, okay, we can see at this point in his career, this is not, you know, four or five years ago where he is average above average defense. Like he was always good in the team defense concept. And I think he still can be, but attacking Chris Middleton one-on-one isn't the same as it was, you know, five years ago. The advantage goes to the offense a little bit more now, but what Chris brings offensively, it's more of the same steady Chris. We know what he's going to do. If you look at his numbers on the per 36 basis with him having his limit playing time, he's right in alignment with what you would expect Chris to be doing. So there are things that with this team where you're like, when Chris gets back to his regular minutes allocation, when Dame finally gets into form to match with Giannis, when these guys start getting used to playing with each other, maybe we make some rotation switches where we're not staggering Giannis and Dame as much to start so these guys can continue building those reps and getting used to playing with one another. Like, let's spam that pick and roll. Let's keep doing it until these guys know how to do it with their eyes closed. Like, there are still things to be worked on, and the benefit is that we're only 10 games into the season. So there is still time to do that. But I definitely agree with you about we need this team to, this offense to really function at a high level and for this defense to at least be average for this Bucks team to have uh, that championship contention that we thought that they could seeing the roster um, in the offseason. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, I would add to that that your point about spamming the pick and roll. I think we just saw that with the horn set with Dame mm-hmm. and two bigs high once against the Bulls. It worked uh, with Bobby Portis and Brooke coming out there. But that's another thing. Just keep spamming that. If, if for no other reason, number one, to juice your offense, but also – Teams are going to adjust. So the more reps you can see of, okay, how are they going to defend this and how do we counter, I think is is also important to start to to build up um, here. So hopefully we start to see that tonight. Your point about Giannis and how he's looked since the Pacers game too. I kind of take that as, you know, Giannis, we heard him after a couple of games recently. And and even after, what, the Magic game, uh, number one, very critical of the defense, but also saying he wanted to shoulder some of the, the leadership even more. That I took that as Giannis just saying, we're still figuring things out in the interim. I just got to take over and dominate, and we'll continue to to figure all of this uh, this stuff out moving forward. Uh, the last really, really quick thing is, you mentioned it too, it's 10 games. Yeah. We we just, look, I'm not saying everything is great and that everything Absolutely is, is what we expected it to be. It, it's not where we expected it to be, but it's 10 games. There's still a lot of runway to figure this out and to move in the right direction. So let's pump the brakes and just calm down a bit. Wait until you get at least 25 to 30 games mm-hmm. of a, uh, a sample size to rush to any judgment here. Uh, Camille will be back later tonight with Frank to break down the revenge game in Toronto. And hopefully for your sake too, since you rewatched it this morning, it is nothing like the uh, first match. I hope not. I can't saw. take it. <laughs> what a day for you if that's, the case, but they'll be back tomorrow or tonight to uh, to recap that matchup for Camille. I'm Justin. We'll talk to you next time.